It's a privilege to be asked to introduce today's um, session with our distinguished um, panel members. We are delighted to have here with us Lady Kishwa Desai. Um, Lady Desai is a best-selling um, author and highly respected columnist for The Guardian, The Indian Express, and other broadsheets. She's done much work on gender relations in India, uh, previously worked in television for over 20 years as producer and head of television channels. And it was a particular news piece some time ago on female infanticide, which led Lady Desai to write her first novel in 2010, channeling her outrage on violence into a series of critically acclaimed novels. Her latest novel, you've seen the displays outside, The Sea of Innocence, is the third in a series of books concerning critical women issues in India. Her first novel, uh, Witness the Night, dealt with female infanticide in India and won the Costa Book Award in 2010 for the best first novel and has since been translated in over 25 languages. It was also shortlisted for the Authors Club First Novel Award and longlisted for the Manation Literary Prize. Her critically acclaimed novel, Origins of Love, was published in 2012 and is about surrogacy and IVF, a topical issue in both India and other parts of the world. This new book, The Sea of Innocence, um, it deals with the emotive issue of women's security in an atmosphere of heightened sexual violence and has a very strong resonance with the recent incidents of rape and gang rape in India, uh, about which I'm sure you're all familiar. And following the disturbing rape and murder of the recent 23-year-old Delhi student in December 2012, um, there has been an unrelenting international focus on sexual violence in the world's largest democracy. During tonight's event, Lady Desai will provide a contemporary commentary on the attitudes of men and women towards victims of um, sexual violence, looking at issues of gender bias in the police, in the caste system, very entrenched, and the impact of skewed demographics caused by sex selection. I'll just take a quote from Lady Desai. The characters in her novels are the antithesis of the popular notion of Indian women in cinema, literature, art, and in real life. And as an Asian woman myself, born and brought up in India, I'm very much looking forward with intense interest, I must say, to this evening's discussion. So on the stage with Lady Desai today, um, I'm pleased to introduce you to our very own Professor Stephen Chan, uh, who our director has um, already introduced. I just want to say a few words about Stephen. Um, Stephen's Professor of uh, International Relations and one of UK's most respected academics on international politics and relations. He's made a significant impact on political developments in Asia and Africa, particularly through his involvement in high-level diplomacy, serving as a member of the Africa-China-US Trilateral Dialogue, in an effort, which is an effort to establish a common set of principles to help govern the emerging trade wars involving the three regions. Stephen was awarded the OBE in 2010 for services to Africa and higher education. In that same year, the International Studies Association awarded him the title of Eminent Scholar in Global Development. He's published about 28 books. Stephen will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and I think I've counted them very carefully on international relations more than 300 articles, features and reviews, plus novels, poetry, and short stories, among very many other activities he's involved. Uh, in his most recent book, The End of Certainty, Stephen takes a fresh and provocative look on world politics today, arguing that international politics has failed because the certainties traditional philosophy failed to help us understand power shifts and struggles in an endlessly diverse world. I think I'll stop there, um, uh, but I do hope you'll enjoy um, tonight's event, and you are as excited as we all are here at the school. Um, we are, you know, goes without saying, we're very excited about the future for SOAS, and um, I, on that note, will conclude and pass over to um, Lady Desai and um, Stephen to, to start our discussion. Thank you very much. Oh, 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, my very great pleasure to be with you tonight and to host uh, Lady Desai, who, as I'm sure all of you know, is rapidly becoming one of the significant authors of modern India, not only for her ability to treat serious themes with the gravity that they deserve, but to write about them in an accessible manner. And I think that is a very rare combination that she manages to achieve with considerable elan and which she's managed to sustain through four works, and these works have become celebrated. They do not shirk from some of the more difficult undercurrents that are now making themselves felt closer and closer to the surface of contemporary Indian life. So I wanted to begin by talking to her about her latest novel, uh, The Sea of Innocence, uh, which features a mystery surrounding the disappearance and the rape of a certain young woman. And as Nirmala said, this rape bears the echoes, it bears, as it were, the resonance of what actually happened in Delhi towards the end of last year, when there was a gang rape of a young student on a bus that was horrific in its execution, certainly absolutely horrific in its consequences, but which seemed at the same time to be the tip of an iceberg that no one in India was prepared to acknowledge or discuss with the gravity and the seriousness that such things deserve. So books of this sort, I think, help to continue to raise the profile of how to deal with gender issues, particularly those touched with violence, in an emerging superpower that India is now becoming. But Lady Desai, I was actually in Delhi the week before this rape uh, occurred. And it was a momentous time for all kinds of reasons in India. It was the time of the death of Bala Thakare, for instance, the, uh, depending on your point of view, uh, either eminent or notorious nationalist figure in Calcutta. It was a time of great debate about whether or not a nationalist uh, Hindu <laughs> way forward was the way forward for India, or the maintenance of a secular way. There was no debate at all in that week preceding the rape about the role of gender, and then suddenly a very, very gender-specific, gender-centered crime of horrific dimensions hit the headlines. And I'm just wondering how you've tried to reflect that in your latest novel, which is set on the beautiful beaches of Goa. Uh, you might think that you're in some kind of tourist paradise. It concerns the disappearance and the rape of a, a tourist. And it reminded me very, very much of Delhi. Of course, the drivers in Delhi almost go out of their way. You almost have to bribe them to take you out of the cultivated, cosmopolitan, modern center of the new city of Delhi, where all things work. And you almost have to bludgeon them, as I said, to take you to the poorer parts of town, as if somehow you could disguise or keep people away from an underlying reality. And I think your book goes straight to the heart of this underlying reality. But I would like to know, and I'm sure the audience would like to know, how you came to write this book and how you decided to concentrate on this theme of gender violence. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank everybody for being uh, here today. Uh, it's a very special day for me to be here at SOAS, and I'm absolutely honored. So thank you very much. And to be interviewed by somebody like you, Stephen, I've... When I was listening to the list of things you've done, I almost felt like I should have been actually interviewing you. Uh, now, the other way, <laughs> the, you know, what, what you spoke about, the fact that there was no discussion on gender uh, before this rape actually took place is absolutely correct. Because I think gender was very much at the bottom of the heap. Wh whatever discussion you wanted to have in India, about women, about women and about women's rights were almost always likely to be scuttled. And the, the really sad part about this whole issue is that even in Parliament, where women have been struggling to get a 30% reservation in Parliament, has been delayed year on year by parliamentarians who get up and mostly male, all, all, of the, all the men will get up and, and give you, you know, absolutely absurd arguments about it and, and stroll it and scuttle it. Indeed, the last time there was a physical fight which took place on, a, you know, on the floor of parliament which actually delayed the bill. So, you know, there is a certain kind of patriarchy that exists in India. Uh, I grew up in India as a working woman there. 
I was fortunate that I didn't personally have to face it, but there, there's a lot of discrimination, there's a lot of prejudice, there's a lot of sexual harassment that I could see in front of me because I used to, as, as uh, you know, Nirmala mentioned, I used to run a television channel. I also worked as a journalist for and as a television producer for over 20 years. So I knew there was a gender bias and I knew that all these things existed and it used to enrage me. It used to really make me angry that we are discussing all these, un, you know, other issues about growth rate and, you know, and this and that and the other, but which is all very important. But, but the main issue, if there is more violence taking place within homes, which is how I saw it, which is where young girls first get indoctrinated into this whole issue that violence against you is going to happen. It is going to be uh, something that you take for granted. And it starts at home. It starts with the baby girl that people don't want. And it just carries on. It, then it carries on to the, you know, when she's going to get married. It could be a dowry death. Then it could be honor killings if she decides to step out of the home. So, you know, all those issues. So I already was, uh, you know, as all Indian women are, uh, was aware of the fact that there was a huge gender problem. So when I was asked to write these series of books, I had already thought that I would write a book on rape and sexual violence as long back as about you know four years ago when I'd first started thinking about this series because it was obvious to me that the newspapers were reporting these cases and they were reporting them in very lurid terms, you know, catching front pages and things like that. But within a day or so, the, the papers and, and the media attention move on to something else. And usually the victim would become the criminal. In very many of the cases, uncomfortable questions would be asked of her. She would be uh, treated as though she should not have been at a particular place. Indeed, even for this particular girl who was uh, gang raped, uh, I am still asked when I talk about these issues in India, but what was she doing there at 10 o'clock at night? Why was she out there with her boyfriend? Why was she dressed the way she was dressed? So, you know, these are things which used to upset me. So I decided that I needed to write this book and I started researching it four years ago. And it was a horrible coincidence because um, I was actually doing my final edit at, in, in December. And the eerie thing is, I still get goosebumps when I say this, the eerie thing is that my book timeline is December. It's set in Goa, so it is December. So I actually was able to incorporate, because I write contemporary novels. I, I write about India as India is happening, what is going on about current issues. They're all integrated into my novels. So I was able to mention the fact that there is this girl who has been raped while my heroine is going out there and looking for the, I mean, the central protagonist is looking for a girl who's gone missing in, on the beaches of Goa, who's presumed to be raped. She's thinking about this girl who's gone through this horrible incident at home. And indeed her mother and her adopted daughter go and join the protests at India Gate, you know? So I tried to sort of bring the real issues into the novels because as you mentioned, I don't want people to think this is some fantasy land I'm talking about. And I don't want to set my novels 300 years you know, earlier or 300 years hence. It's here and now. And we need to talk about these issues. But you want very much not to celebrate a fantasy land, but a very, very real land. One of the questions that kept striking me on that visit was to what extent it was a schizophrenic land. And I'm mindful, for instance, particularly of India Gate, uh, which is a huge arch which celebrates by having inscribed on it the names of every single Indian soldier who fell in World War I, for instance. It's a huge and in its own way a very, very magnificent um, monument. But I was in India as a speaker at the Hindustan Times Leadership Summit, uh, which is this huge extravaganza. And two things struck me about this particular extravaganza, and that was uh, there were no women speakers. Uh, everything was a male-dominated celebration of power and influence. But they did have a, a grand party, and all of the Bollywood stars and starlets turned up to this party. And people like Shah Rukh Khan uh, came to this party. He's sort of like the, the Brad Pitt of uh, Indian uh, cinema. Uh, 
but what really struck me as the guests came in was that you had all of these absolutely beautiful starlets and without exception, every single one of them uh, was hanging on the arm of a much older, extraordinarily ugly, but obviously extraordinarily rich man. <laughs> and it seemed that the fantasy that you see on the screen is actually answered by this reality of a certain kind of huge disparity in terms of what the genders are expected to achieve, even in the most glittering and the most glamorous part of well, Indian life. Uh, I think uh, you might, yes, you do have a point there that even, even a cinema is not uh, a land which is, you know, egalitarian in any mm. way. Uh, I do want to say one thing about a cinema, though, that it has allowed mm. some of these starlets to play fairly bold roles, uh, especially in recent times. So I would not uh, say that, you know, cinema is completely uh, uh, sort of... Uh, alien to the issues or does not deal with the issues which are happening in India today. Of course, they deal with them in their own way. And so you do have a lot of naked bodies. And there is a huge debate which is going on in cinema in India today, which is that whether they should be doing the kind of item, I, I think you're all familiar with item numbers, whether they should be doing these, uh, what they call duck duck item numbers, you know, which get the audience all uh, worked up because what it is doing is that it is also titillating the audience in a very obvious and blatant fashion. So some of these images, unfortunately, are also images that a lot of people seem to carry as being the reality of the Indian woman, whereas it is not. What you attended, Stephen, was like a point five zero 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 five percent of what uh, you know India is all about. I mean, the Hindustan Times summit. Sorry, it's the largest selling daily in India, but that summit that, and the people there do not represent Indian reality. But those women who were there definitely represent the kind of aspirations, uh, you know, the kind of woman that a man would like to have in his life. And they represent that. And because it is a highly, it is still not a literate society by and large, these visual images, there is a big question mark right now. Are these images kind of feeding into a fantasy that real life cannot sustain? And one more thing I just want to add to this is that the lyrics which are now going along with some of these songs, you know, I don't know if you've if you're uh, listened to that, you know, about uh, I'm a tandoori chicken, you know, just uh, swallow me whole, and uh, or uh, you know, stick my lips with yours as fevicol, and all is done with you know all the <laughs> requisite movements and hip shaking and all that. And um, the the fact is, we all have to reconsider whether these images in a country like this, where there's been huge genocide which means that, you know, some of you are aware of the statistics, 37 million more men in India today because of this systematic killing and uh, sex selection which has happened in India has led to a situation where there is also huge levels of frustration because those images do not match reality and some of these rapes which are taking place, this is what my younger colleagues who are now working in India tell me, is a kind of a pushback you know, men are getting angry seeing these young women out there, unattainable. The only way they can attain them is if they move in as a gang and rape her, you know, in a physical gang rape. And there are people who have written about this as well, that the item number that you see on screen is nothing more than an actual rape taking place. Albeit, you know, they do not take her clothes off. <laughs> they had very few clothes to take off anyway. But she's, she is like, you know, in the middle usually of a huge bunch of men who are dancing around her and sort of almost lusting after her. So what you see then replicated in real life is the physical disrobing of a real girl who in recent times could be as young as five or six. And it makes no difference to them. No, I absolutely take your point. I mean, off and on, uh, I've been watching Indian uh, cinema since the 1980s, and it certainly has become much more blatant at the same time as the pageantry has become much more complex, as if the aspirational side of it has to be choreographed into something which has this dichotomous series of meanings. Mm -hmm. But insofar as it is aspirational, and insofar as you've written a number of novels which have become extraordinarily popular, 
And if they were to make a movie of the latest novel uh, with all of its very serious themes, how would you wish to cast the lead figure, Sinran Singh, who is a very complex Indian woman? Yes. Well, you know, that's going to be a real problem for, for Indian filmmakers because, you know, mm. my Simran Singh is the kind of woman you do not see in Indian cinema at all because she's middle-aged, uh, you know. That's why, actually, I wrote her because I found that, you know, middle-aged women uh, do not appear as heroines in Indian cinema. They do not appear as heroines in Indian literature, per se. Mostly, most of the literature would have very beautiful and very urbane, very sophisticated or very rural. But, you know, somewhere the prettiness, the, the, the docility, if you like, you know, the kind of... So Simran Singh, my heroine, is neither docile, <laughs> nor is she willing to listen to anyone. She considers herself voluptuous because, you know, she's overweight, I guess. And she, she is very much an in-your-face woman. She does not listen to anyone, including her mother, who wants her to get desperately get married, get married, but she doesn't want to do. She adopts a child uh, who's, uh, you know, who's 14 years old. I mean, who does that? I mean, she's completely bonkers, you know? So, so I think but that is what I think people have liked about Simran Singh, is that people all over the world can relate to her because she's the kind of woman they, they want to be, or they can identify with. She's real. Did you, so did you write the, the, her answer as is, the short moment, answer is, I don't think any <laughs> Indian producer in his, in his right mind, if he's plied with alcohol and you know, given something, oh, go and make this film. You know? you know, you'll get Ashwarya Rai in your next film or some deal is done with him, he might do it. But I do have a very sane British producer mm. <laughs> who is willing and has taken the chance and is making a film mm. with the first uh, novel, Witness the Night, which is also a very dark look at mm. uh, gender side and uh, where Simran appears for the first time. So, I mean, to what extent is she very much an Indian creation, a figure for the difficult times in India? And to what extent does she mirror an international trend female detectives, for instance, even though she herself is a social worker yeah. who takes on certain qualities of a, a yeah. campaigning detective. But you have Scandinavian figures, you have African figures in the McCall Smith novels. Is it the moment of you know, the great African female detective who does things that men can't do? Yeah, I just wish all of this were true, you know, that I had actually you know, sat down and said, oh my God, I'm going to in invent this wonderful female detective and she's going to go out. But actually, that's not the way I think most novels get written. Most novels, um, or at least my novel, definitely, the first one, it was my first novel, Witness the Night, it got written, as I said, out of sheer rage. I got tired of living in a country where murder could be atoned. I mean, you could kill your baby girl and nobody's going to put you behind bars. What kind of a country is this? And it was not something, as I said, which was happening 200 years you know, ago, it was something which I was seeing as a journalist, as, as a working woman, happening every day. Every day there would be a small item somewhere about some baby girl into whose throat had been stuffed, you know, either opium or raw husks of wheat who had been strangled, who had been thrown out of a window in a hospital. I read about hospitals where no baby girl had ever been born. Oh, you know, isn't that amazing? No baby girl ever born. And there, there were villages in India which were treated as amazing but true stories. No baby girl ever born in this village. It is not real. So it was something which used to make me extremely, extremely angry. So that book was written out of sheer rage. Um, I had also met a woman. It was written because I had met a woman who actually came to me for one of my talk shows. And she started telling me the story of her life. And she said she wasn't meant to be around because when she was um, just born, her relatives told her this later on. As a teenager, she was told the story. Is that, uh, you know, she had been given an overdose of opium. And this is very, very plausible because in Punjab, that's how you used to get rid of your unwanted baby girls because they would just go to sleep. They just never wake up. So she had been given an overdose of opium. Um, then when I started researching, I found that there were also other means of killing baby girls, which were much more inventive. They would put them into pots and drown them in milk and then bury the pots and, you know, stuff like that. 
and sing songs saying, go away now, next time there's a song about it, which they sang, go away now, next time come back, bring a brother. So, you know, it was like perfectly acceptable. So when I wrote this, all I wanted to do was get that anger out. I did not know that anybody would even read this book, <laughs> forget about inventing a character. But I did want to, to, for it to be a book of hope. So it is a very dark story, but I wanted to put in the heart of it a woman with a sense of humor, who could deal with these issues, who could deal with these tough issues. So I invented Simran Singh, who's a detective, as, uh, she's not a detective, she's a social worker. She's a very rich woman. I wanted her to make, make her completely independent from any patriarchal influence, you know, benevolent or malevolent, whatever. Just no one. She was her own person, so she had to be very independent, very rich. She could have done nothing with her life, but she decides to do it. She decides to go out and do social work but very tough social work. Mm. You know, the kind that takes her into jails, the kind that takes her into... So she was an, sort of unusual. So when I um, thought of her, I really didn't think, A, that the book would ever get published. B, I thought nobody is ever going to want to read about a middle-aged woman, you know, who drinks and smokes and has lots of lovers. I gave her lots of lovers. I said, great, go out there, do what you like. So, you know, I did all those things, but amazingly, it worked. It got the Costa Award and, you know, just kind of, you know. No, the book's been worked. very successful, but at the same time, I mean, you mentioned now two of your books. We began with Sea of Innocence. We've had a brief talk about Witness the Night, but an Origins of Love as well. You've actually maintain this bleak theme, this theme of great despair, uh, yeah. particularly on gender issues, and I, yeah. if I dare say oh, on, on class issues also, you know, for three very immaculate novels. Well, uh, you know, uh, Origins of Love was, uh, again, uh, something which is a big issue in India today, which is uh, renting out of wombs. It's actually a slightly medical novel, you know, in, in, terms, in the terms that it is set within a hospital. Uh, space, but what is happening? I I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are, there is a drop in fertility all over the world. So you do have uh, extremely poor women in India being asked to sort of give uh, you know rent out their wombs for a period of about a year, so that some uh, rich couple somewhere or somebody who can afford it can go and um, you know have a baby. Nothing wrong with that. We've all heard of lovely, joyful stories about couples getting children, but it is happening in the absence of a law. And that was really bothering me. You know, that there is a law that was formulated about, you know, four or five years ago, maybe even, uh, you know, more than that, which has never been presented in Parliament. So you have loads of, just in my colony itself, in, in, in Delhi, you know, uh, you know, in the area I live in, I have seen at least 10 fertility centers come up just in the last one year, which offer you children and offer you this, that, and the other. But they use the bodies of these very poor women who are usually illiterate, who do not, who can't even read the contract. They can't even read the, what has been written there. Of course, they're looked after and they're paid some amount of money. Usually, you know, a couple of uh, thousand pounds would be paid to them for that whole year, but they, they're normally then separated from their families. They are also, because they're kept like, literally like hens in a coop in, in, uh, in houses which are then rented by those hospitals so that they can be monitored because the main thing is not the woman, the main thing is the baby. The baby has to be looked after and it, it must be born safe and sound. So it's, it's very good if you know that this is happening. So I thought I would want to write a book because it's suddenly become a very popular, I believe Shah Rukh Khan is having his next child through surrogacy. Amir Khan has already had a child uh, through surrogacy. So, you know, you have a lot of people going in for surrogacy, but do they know that what is happening and is it a commodification? I mean, it's an open, none of my books, I mean, I, I don't want them to be judgmental. I do want them, I do want the issue to be put out there and for you to decide whether this is but are they judgmental or not? I mean, in Origins of Love, which is about this issue of surrogacy, there's an indictment of the West as well, and Western couples. No, who Indian it. couples, as I said, Shah Rukh Khan. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, this is happening with, with anyone who can afford it. I mean, there, there are people who are literally going, going down the ladder. Normal working class people who can't have a child any other way are going in for surrogacy. But they do not know that they're doing this without an actual law in existence. So. There are loads of legal battles. Let me tell you who's getting rich. The doctors are getting rich. The lawyers are getting even richer because everybody who goes there and has a child will find that there's some legal entanglement. 
A lot of gay couples have suddenly walked into a minefield, which in fact I had flagged up in my book, that it is a minefield, because India suddenly, at the beginning of the year, changed the law and said no more gay couples can come in and <laughs> have a child by surrogacy. But hello, there were already so many babies which were being born to gay couples. And so what happens to them? So more legal battles. So the whole story is about the commodification of women's bodies. Should we reduce her to, sorry to use the word, but you're all grown up here. Should we uh, reduce her to a vagina? Or should we reduce her, which is in the case of prostitution? Or should we reduce her to just a womb, which is what she begins to be, because even her family will support her. Go, 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 have this baby. Because you know they end up with two or three lakhs of rupees, which is a lot of money, more money than they'll ever see. The one woman I met, for example, her husband is a rag picker. So she's never going to see that kind of money in her life. So she went in for it. you know. And she had only one child. And she told me, I'm doing this for this kid because then I can educate her properly. And after this, I will have two more through surrogacy. Then we will build a house. And then I will have, you know, on But it. that raises precisely, you know, I think a very, very important question. If there's no choice, mm -hmm. and you know, when you go to India, not just in Delhi, but particularly in places like Mumbai, and you see the huge disparities of wealth, you know, the extremely rich uh, have got grander establishments than you'll find in, around Hyde Park and, and Knightsbridge and Hampstead. Absolutely. Uh, where, whereas the poor uh, you know, live uh, in an extremely powerless condition. If there's no choice uh, and women do this, if they commodify themselves because there's no other way to commodify any other yes. aspect of their existence. Is there, as it were, something missing in the critique which concentrates only on the violence being done to them, when in fact the critique should be because they have no hope whatsoever in any case? I agree. I mean, we should have a better social service system. Mm -hmm. We should have better maternal care because that's what one of the women told me who'd gone for surrogacy. She said, this is the first time I'm being looked after mm -hmm. in a hospital because when she had her own babies, Nobody gave a damn. I mean, it didn't matter. She could just have them on the road as far as the family was concerned. They were not looking after her. So the first episode, you know, there are huge issues there of ethics, of what is right, what is not right. And, and as you said, of choices. Why do women make these choices? Is it because they want to do it or is there a kind of a social uh, pressure on them? So I just want to add to this, you know, what does social pressure do to you? Uh, in a lot of cases, when these little babies are killed, uh, baby girls are killed, they're killed by the mother. You know, I mean, that is one of the most shocking facts which come up. So how does a woman do it? And I did talk to a psychiatrist, um, you know, and I said, how do you explain this? It's, it's baffling. I'm a mother myself of a beautiful girl. I would never, ever even dream of doing this. So, um, so he said, it, is, it might be that at that time, it's the one time that she feels accepted by society. She is doing, she becomes as patriarchal as the society around her. It's the one time she's doing what everybody ar around her would like her to do and she gets social acceptance at that point. So do women really have choices if they are so economically and socially deprived? If the woman in the household is the last one to eat, the last one to get health care, the last one to get any love, or affection, isn't that the message that she's passing on to her children? That you know, women, in essence, are a marginal uh, section of society and are quite dispensable. You know, so if you kill a baby girl, it's all right. If you rent out your womb and you're saving the family, it's all right. You know, you, as I said, sustain this theme, which I, I find an extraordinarily bleak and depressing theme to do with gender violence and denigration uh, through three novels, and yet you said you would like at some stage in your work to hold out a beacon of hope yes. for women. Yeah. What is the beacon of hope? Well, I think uh, largely it is uh, Simran Singh, you know, uh, because she is a woman <laughs> and she goes out there and gets stuck into these difficult issues. But she also finds people around, which I think we all do if we were to only look around. You know, you do find uh, pillars of support. If you go out there and you want to make a change and you, you want to talk about this and you, you know, for example, me. I mean, you know, four or five years ago, I would never, ever have imagined that having written a book 
which deals with gender, I would be called to so as no way. <laughs> if I'd written on, as I was talking to somebody earlier, the history of the Mongols or something, maybe you might have called me in. But, uh, but gender, uh, to, to write about uh, something which, you know, most people, of course, they are gender studies. I, I do understand that. But to do a fictional work, which is, again, a non-serious way, maybe, of treating a serious subject. This is how it was regarded. When my first book did come out, people asked questions in India. They st Firstly, they would question me. Firstly, they would say, when I talked about genocide, they said, it is not happening. Why are you even talking about it? The only way I got some, you know, sort of, uh, what should I say, they, they began to believe in what I was saying and what other people were saying, is when the census came out. And that is when people realized that there were just 914 girls for every 1,000 boys. So many people like me in India who are trying to raise this red flag were not talking rubbish. So firstly, there is denial. And I think that is the most important thing, which lesson I learned is that most people don't want to listen. So you have to persuade them. But that's precisely an interesting question in terms of how the public debate is conducted. I mean, maybe because I've not seen all of your interviews. Uh, obviously, I, I, I have not. But those I've seen were almost exclusively conducted by female interviewers. Is there a vast discrepancy in the way that a male interviewer would try to question you about the work that you're trying to do? Stephen, now, am I supposed to do a critique of your questioning? <laughs> Um, but um, uh, would you be the first man to interview me? Ah, uh, that's a good question actually, I haven't I thought about it. I can't find any footage. Oh really, that, that is interesting, it might quite be true, <laughs> it might quite be true. Uh, one of the reasons it could be true also is that India is largely, you know, there are a lot of uh, women uh, journalists and so it could be, it could be entirely possible that um, I just went that way. But he's quite right. I mean, uh, women's uh, issues are becoming relevant to everybody. But what was very heartening, though it took a horrible incident like the December 16 rain uh, to take place, was the number of young men we saw on the streets of Delhi who were holding up placards and saying, we are not like this. You know, we want we we support the women on the street, and I think that was a change. And yes, uh, perhaps I had to come all the way to so as to get interviewed by a male. Um, you know, but the point is that this is a change that will take time. People, as I said, even women don't want to talk about gender. The the women in my audience initially were the first ones to deny that gender side was taking place. They're the first ones to say, what was she doing there at 10 o'clock at night? There, there are comfort zones that we want to hide behind, especially the middle class. The middle class is very good at that because we want to maintain the status quo, you know? And, and the, the poor are actually not able to talk about these issues at all. So you're right. Uh, perhaps the women will lead the change. It doesn't matter where it comes from. I think Indian women need to get more angry and I'm very happy if a lot of the young journalists who came to talk to me are enraged by this and they are angry and they want to keep this conversation going. So, and they need to be angry because that's the only way you, you bring about any change. Otherwise, everybody will say it's all right, you know, and you won't have anything uh, being any different. Thank you for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that I've done what I need to do by way of introducing, I think, some very, very profound themes that are absolutely the stuff of negative-sized work. Kishwar, please call me Kishwar. Kishwar-sized work. And what we had always wanted to do was to use this as an opener so that you as members of the audience could also have a chance to ask her questions, to make comments of your own. So I think that we should enter about 30 minutes now uh, of doing exactly that. Uh, if uh, you wish to make a question, uh, could you please stand up and identify yourself first, please? The gentleman with the red vest. Uh, the... There's a microphone. It's not possible to bring about societal change where the members of parliament or member of legislative assembly are, some of them are convicts, uh, they have committed crime of rape and other things. 
uh, with corruptions and all. It's well documented, yet nothing happens in a society where the legislators themselves are guilty of the crimes. Mm -hmm. well, that's very true. I mean, I, I could agree with you more. And, and this point has been raised over and over again, especially when the anti-rape bill was being passed in Parliament. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were asking the question, but half the rapists are sitting in Parliament. <laughs> you know, so what kind of bill are they going to pass? And, um, and there was, in fact, uh, you know, an attempt also to water down some of the, uh, you know, sort of uh, parts of the bill, because which the men were finding extremely uncomfortable, especially the bill, uh, you know, part of the bill that deals with stalking or voyeurism, because they just felt that, oh my God, if we look at a beautiful woman, you know, next to you, you guys, you, all you women will want us behind bars. They were really worried about what it would do to their security and, and the, the ease with which they go out and do these things rather than worrying about what was going to happen to the women. And women, <coughs> women. So I couldn't agree with him more. That's true. It's the gentleman in the grey suit, please. Do you think that Eve teasing, which is so, dare I say, rampant in India, is perhaps um, a contributory factor to, to what we're seeing at the moment because I know on my visits, <clears throat> even on the underground, this sort of thing seemed to be almost endemic. It, the, it wasn't just that one or two people were involved, it seemed to be that everyone was at it. And, and you, you, as a Westerner, of course, I was so shocked. I tried not to take any notice of it, but it was so much in your face, you couldn't ignore it. Yeah, no, you're quite right, because, of course, the <laughs> term Eve teasing is a bit odd, and maybe it should be Sita teasing or Radha teasing or something, but it, it's, it's true. All of us have grown up with that. I mean, I, you know, when I would travel in buses, when I was, you know, in college or school or whatever, you just did your best to protect yourself. You know, you just went into a huddle and got into, you know, one side of the bus because you knew exactly what was going to happen. And if you were, God forbid, stranded on a lonely road, I mean, you know, you could you could have the worst done to you. So that is a pretty common experience. And and now, again, as I said, some of the, the younger, my younger colleagues tell me that after the rape case, there is a new game which has come into uh, the minds of these slightly depraved young men, I think, on uh, stations at the, you know, as you said, mentioned the metro station and places like that, where they start, if they see a girl alone they, and they're in a group, then they start almost insinuating that they're going to rape her. So they will start saying, shall we, kar de, le jai, you know, like kind of insinuating that they're going to do and, and watch her getting more and more terrified and enjoying, enjoying it. So there is a, uh, you know, I just, I just want to also just take a minute to talk about gang rape, you know, because I think there is this new, a new kind of, it's almost a, a new word for me, you know, it's a new lexicon of rape, as it were, because when we, when we talked about in the past of gang rape, if you look at it, what happens in, in the UK, gangs are these street gangs, you know, sort of bunch of kids getting together, and of course they do rape, they do get together and they do rape people. But in India, it has now become of, sometimes if it's urban India, it could be just a random set of people who are just getting together for an evening's entertainment. So they're not even in the, in the old sense a gang. We've had gang rape in, um, in villages, in rural areas, where the caste system is pretty well entrenched. So the upper caste were always, in a sense, allowed access, uh, you know, and, and to gang rape women from the lower caste, that, that was like part of their, and they would get away. It's not permitted, but they would think it was permitted because they were of a higher caste. And uh, those of you who remember the, the famous story of Bandit Queen and Buddha Devi and you know, things like that, well, that is how it all began because she was gang raped. And then it, you know, she went on to take her revenge because she was of a lower caste. So, you know, there are, there are issues about where this, because thanks to gendercide, there is also a real problem that men do not have access to women physically, practically, because there are not enough women. They've killed them all. 
you know, so what do you do? So, uh, like Draupadi, you know, in the past, where to share five husbands, so you have Draupadi-like syndromes happening in states like Haryana, where one family will buy a girl, import a girl, or one of them will marry, one brother will marry, then the rest of the brothers will share, the father-in-law will also share, everybody else will get a, get a piece of her. And now they're telling me that there are exchange melas. I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody just told me there are these exchange festivals where if you're bored with her, you go and exchange her for somebody else. So I think there is a certain mentality which is also having grown through years of gendercide, years of marginalizing women and making them physically irrelevant. So when you see a woman, you don't see a woman. You see a piece of flesh. You see me. You see somebody like on screen, you know, and, and that's the woman you want, but you can't have her, so you just take whatever's available. The day my book was launched in Delhi, uh, the, the, and we had the law minister launching it, and we thought everything is going to be fine, and you know, the next day there was a horrible rape of the five-year-old who had candles and all kinds of things stuffed into her vagina by two men. And, uh, and, uh, and the police actually tried to bribe the parents to shut up about it and not go to the media. So we are still living in a stage where incidents like this, where men feel they can get away with it, and they do, you know. There was a gentleman in the next team, that's right. Having established that there is a shortage of females, why do you think males are successful in getting so much in their dowry demands? Well, because it is a patriarchal society. At the end of the day, the people still feel that their men are special. Uh, and that, you know, I mean, their boys are something special. They have invested. The, the whole idea, why don't, let's just examine the issue. Why don't they want baby girls in the house? Why don't they want, because it's a useless investment. You're never going to get any returns. All you're doing is investing and bringing her out, but she's going to go off and live in somebody else's home anyway. So she's going to be useful for them. So the, if you have a boy, you have access to money. Dowry, incidentally, is illegal. But people still ask for it in all kinds and uh, shapes and forms. But to just give you a sense that maybe things are changing, Maybe somewhere women are realizing that they might be worth something if they are in short supply. Uh, two or three cases which I read about recently. One was that um, uh, one girl in Bihar <laughs> refused to get married to when the, the, the bridegroom had come and, and the party had come to the house. She refused to go with him because she, she said, write your address and show me. He couldn't write, he was illiterate. So, and she was 10th class pass, as they said, and she, didn't, she made him go away, that. Then another one, where she, while talking to him, said, oh, he's too stupid, I don't think I want this guy. And the third one refused because she said, you don't have a toilet in your house, I'm not going to go with you. So, you know, so these are instances where some families, and some families are supportive. See, the whole thing is a family unit. How are you bringing up your girls? How are you bringing up your boys? If the family supports the girl who refused to go with the guy who didn't have a toilet in his house, he bloody well had to build that toilet, and he did. So you know, there are, there are issues like this which make us more aware that if women got the support of their families, if their families did not turn into mobs against them, but into loving, parental, supportive, structures, we could have a very different system. Yes, there's a, a woman here just by the colour, yes. Hi, um, since the Delhi rape in December, India's passed new anti-rape laws, which are very good on yeah. paper, but do you think they're ever going to be enforced properly, especially because there are 30 million cases pending? Yeah. No, it's very tough. You know, I, I mean, we were, we were in, in despair because, you know, the, one of the things is that you have um, six or some random number like that fast-track courts operating in, in, in Delhi. And what about the rest of the country? Where is it all? Where is the focus? You know, so they did all this because basically they wanted to shut all the women up who were out there protesting. So there are, there are things which are ongoing uh, within colleges, within universities, within schools. Uh, 
girls are being taught to look after themselves better. So, you know, on our individual basis, on a private basis, things are happening. But if you were to just take the, the account of the fact that the so-called fast track court has been looking at the Nirbhaya case, the gang rape case, for the last six months, and they haven't been able to come to any judgment as yet. We don't even know what is happening to the case because most of us are, are forbidden from reporting it. So we are just still where we were. As far as I'm concerned, it just what actually there were a lot of people who said the existing laws were good enough if only they were implemented properly. So the fault does not lie in the law. The fault lies in the police officer who refuses to acknowledge that there is a complaint. The fault lies in the medical doctor who, said, who just turns a blind eye. In the families who tell the girl, just shut up, keep quiet, forget about it. And, you know, the whole sense of shame, you will bring shame to the family if you go out there and say you've been raped. So I think those are the, those are the issues which we will have to deal with because unless we get somebody who's really interested in gender, you know, this government I don't think is interested in gender. They, they're not enough parliamentarians sitting out there who women, A, I don't know whether that would really make a difference, but that is one of the things. Just We just need somebody who's a feminist, you know, someone who feels strongly about this. But there isn't, I don't think so. Gentlemen here. No, a bit further down is uh, number one here. Kishwa, thank you very much. Um, um, I, I was wondering how, um, uh, w uh, whether uh, class and caste were important issues to you, because I, I heard it mentioned only um, once, once by Stephen, and, and a couple of questions where you mentioned caste. Um, because instead of, uh, the, 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 the reoccurring terms have been, uh, the term has been the Indian woman. Now, do you think the Indian woman um, that explains all sorts of experiences that um, no. women have, or are there other kind of, you know, are there differences within the Indian woman? Yeah, absolutely. I think the caste uh, system has done a great disservice to Indian women because within each caste, I think they still are the lowest of the low. You know, even if the government gives reservations, it's usually the male members of the family who get that support, you know, uh, uh, sort of when, when they have these positive kind of discriminatory uh, efforts which are going on. Uh, so, the, the Indian woman does tend to lose out there and, and as I mentioned, in terms of caste system, of course, because it is taken for granted that the upper caste do have, uh, you know, can manhandle or molest uh, the lower caste woman. Um, there have been some cases which have been reported in the newspapers also where men have barged into the homes of lower caste women while her children are watching and have raped her. So, you know, they, they, they just feel they have complete impunity because some of those uh, uh, attitudes have now been transferred, I think, into um, urban areas where the caste system has been transferred into the class system. Whereas if you have power, then you can do what you like. And which is why a lot of the, the really horrific recent cases which came to light had politicians or powerful figures in the middle of them. But most of the time they came to nothing. You know, even one of the cases which I have written about in this uh, book, which I refer to in passing, is the Scarlet Keeling case, which was a case of a British, um, you know, a teenager who went to Goa and, and was raped and mm -hmm. murdered. But the first thing the police did when they found her naked body on the beach uh, was firstly they said they didn't know who she was, even though she had been on that beach living there practically for the last three or four months. Uh, then they said, oh, she'd gone for a swim, you know, and uh, she took off all her clothes and she went for a swim in the middle of the night. That's what happened to her. So there were various, finally when they, there was a lot of pressure and they tried to get the case investigated, it was like months after the incident had taken place. So, you know, a lot of the the, the hut where she went to, that, that chat was destroyed. So at every level, there is an attempt to stop people. So caste and class, it depends who you are, if you're powerful enough, which is why these guys, as we mentioned earlier, are sitting in parliament, they have rape cases against them, but you know, they take full advantage of it. Gentlemen in the green shirt.
Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, my name is John Paul. I'm from the Harmer Centre for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence in St Andrews. Um, kind of building on what you've just said, uh, yeah, I, I think the film uh, Who Killed Jessica is a very good example of the, the politics kind of covering up for the, for the elites. Um, but my question ties into that and it relates to, um, I guess the clearest example is the Gujarat riots of 2002 where particular violence was focused on women in particularly brutal ways. Um, and I wondered if you had any insights into, um, you know, in the West we have a certain code of chivalry, which I think to a certain extent still stands. Um, and in India there seems to be a code of the reverse chivalry, that women seem to take particularly focus of violence when the, the norms of society break down and, and how that plays out, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to say that there is, um, the Gujarat riots were horrible, but they were not the first riots in India. I, I think we sometimes forget that there are many more victims of, of riots that who exist in India. And I almost became a victim myself because um, my previous name was Anuwalia. And, uh, and I had just put up a name plate outside my house the, just the day before the Sikh riots broke out in, in Delhi. And so they came to burn my house down, they came with the jerry cans. I remember their, their faces very clearly. It's just that my neighbors came and said, no, she's not an actual Sikh, you know. I had to bring my children to the door and say, you know, they've got short hair and, you know, try and convince this. It was just a mob that comes and does whatever it has to do. I was lucky I escaped. But uh, many people did not escape in those Sikh riots, and those riots were also equally brutal. Um, when you look at rape that happens during riots, it's, uh, uh, I think it, they, they also try and get rid of, not just the woman, brutalize her, but they also do not want, especially in communal riots, they do not want that uh, her, her ability, her reproductive, uh, organs are left intact because the idea is that you must kill the other race, you know, you must not allow the other to, to survive. So the woman becomes like a, a vessel for that, you know, and, and I think some of the brutality you saw in the gang rape is also kind of linked to that. But let's, let's go a little further back. During the partition of India, there was a lot that happened which is still buried in popular memory. You know, I mean, my parents also had to leave Lahore and come to, to India. They left everything behind. Uh, so if you look at what, what was done to women then and what has happened to women now, it is just a continuous story of aggression, uh, of, of violation, sometimes, you know, done by others, sometimes done by your own family members because they're trying to save you from rape. So all kinds of things. Sorry. If I can just come back, just to say, but it's interesting how, for example, you mentioned partition, where one of the major crimes was the abduction yeah. of women from the other religion, and then their incorporation as property in the family. Whereas you transition to Gujarat, and it's the murder in the most brutal and horrible ways of the other woman, rather than the abduction. I know part of that is, is partition involves moving and migrating, but it seems a, a, a level of terror above what existed previously. Oh, no, I would not agree with that at all. I would say that everything, Gujarat was not the high point of violation of women. As I said, if you, if you just go through the riots which have happened previously, unfortunately what has happened is Gujarat was at the age of television and in India and it was a highly reported riot because it also happened in a, you know, middle class families were involved and things like that. But what was done I mean, I have read stories of partition, so I know the brutality which took place then. So I think a woman's body is a woman's body. You can violate her in any number of ways. And these ways are not new. These ways are known. And these ways especially exist in popular memory when you're trying to annihilate the other. You know, so it's not, it's not rocket science. It wasn't invented in Gujarat. I don't believe that. Yes, gentlemen in the reddish shirt on the front, front here. Hi, I was just wondering if, if you would care to comment on the difference between uh, gender roles in India with gender roles in her neighbouring countries, uh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. 
is there any significant differences or is that no, I think there is a lot of commonality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I was in Pakistan recently, and I do think that, you know, women there and uh, women uh, from India, when we have shared histories so as Bangladesh, and it's all used to be one of the same country. So I think we do have a lot of commonalities there, and uh, their issues are very much our issues, and the kind of, uh, you know, patriarchy they face, and the kind of... Uh, rage that they encounter. I mean, if you look at what the Taliban, for example, is doing in the border areas, it's, it's horrible. They're actually picking out girls who go to school and killing them and, you know, and things like that. So I think there is, there is a careful targeting and a sense that we have to keep women within a circumscribed space. And as I was saying to the gentleman earlier, you know, these are, these are sort of, you know, maybe historical or or known methodologies which these people have now perfected, but uh, or kind of ingrained, I wouldn't say perfected, they've always been there, but ingrained into their uh, daily existence. So we have a lot of commonalities, yes. Okay, I'm going to take uh, one last question at this stage. I think that you have one up last bit second. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it does follow on actually from the last question a bit, which was about the, um, if you see any differences between the different states in India, um, because just picking up the point on um, gender side, actually I was at a, a Martha Sen lecture on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and he was talking about the data, and he was saying, actually it's not seen across all the states, that really it's seen, not in India. Yeah, north and west, and states like Bengal and Karnataka and Tamil Nadu sure. and Kerala, you don't really get it. Um, so yeah, I guess not just on that issue, but more broadly whether you could discuss some of the issues between different states. Yeah. Uh, no, he's, he's absolutely correct, because this was, used to be actually, uh, very much a North Indian problem. But then I think uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, you saw it also occurring in uh, Tamil Nadu, because that's when Jay Lalita started putting out, you know, those little cradles and saying, don't kill your baby girl, just drop them in a cradle outside, you know, we'll, we'll look after them. So they have been uh, sort of coming in, in, the, uh, in the southern states as well. Shockingly, I mean, I think the statistics also showed that the matriarchal states of the northeast, there was an element coming in there as well. You know, the reason being that science has made it very easy for us to tell the sex of the child. You can do the sex selective abortion before. I mean, like you can do the abortion and not wait for the child to, to be born and then physically kill her. So a lot of families who are, say, lower middle class, middle class, farming communities, whatever, who do not want to rich, rich people, who don't want to divide up their property. It's, for example, in places in, in South Delhi, where I live, which is you know, some of the more wealthier parts of Delhi, you find the sex ratio there is appalling because people just go to uh, clinics and they, they sex select uh, the child. So I think it is beginning to impact. Probably until we sort of, you know, reasonably begin to think of women as good enough to invest in. So yes, Amartya is right. It is not a, um, you know, uh, an all India problem, but it is beginning to impact all India because migration is taking place. People carry those images, those, uh, you know, kind of attitudes with them. So it's not something you can anymore, you know, restrict. And that's the worry. That's what we all, that's the mindset all of us have to change. Can I just comment on the uh, regional disparities? It was a question I had in mind to yeah. actually, uh, I grew up in South India and I studied in the North and I could see the distinct differences in the way women were treated. Even now I feel a lot more um, safer in the South than the north and um, even on public transport you were mentioning about your experiences mm -hmm. in the south you still have that segregation in buses you have women on the and men on the uh, but is that a good thing but this is the point i want to raise with you i mean is assimilation better or is segregation in these sort of circumstances what factors would you attribute to the fact that south has consistently seen a fewer cases of rape and sexual violence, either due to underreporting or it could be the other uh, no, thing. No, that's not true actually. There's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of underreporting. You think there's underreporting? Yeah, they're not coming out of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, so, so, you know, in terms of just attitudes, why is there a difference in attitudes? That's what the question is in, in, the, in the North and the South. Mm -hmm. But I thought we just um, established that probably the North has always been, it's been quite an endemic problem in the North yeah. and the yeah. West. And yeah. Less so in the South. Yeah, it, it has been more so in the North, definitely. But as I said, the, um, the, the idea always was, you know, I mean, there, there are historical reasons as well, which deal with the fact that, you know, if you look at Punjab, they needed men to fight, and, you know, there, are, there has always been a less, especially after even things like the partition took place, where, you know, women were given lesser value, you did not want your woman to be abducted or raped. So, uh, a lot of adult uh, women were killed by their own family. They were made to kneel in the, you know, on the ground and then um, killed. So, the attitudes, yes, do differ. And they differ because of, you know, farming practices and, you know, dowry and, you know, all those kind of endemic kind of practices which uh, people have in the north. Uh, but I do think that um, living in the south, possibly, uh, I, I would also give some credit to education, you know, there has always been a higher um, emphasis on education. And I, and I do think that states like Kerala and you know, others which have a high uh, literacy rate do rather less badly on these uh, parameters, you know. Also, in 2001, there was a national policy for the empowerment of women, mm. which was adopted, and uh, it started giving microcredits. Uh, could be, to, yes, there could be economic women. reasons, and, yes. And they've been much more successful in the South than the North. Mm. Particularly Kerala, where it's a combination of both a matriarchal society plus. Mm. Um, yeah, so there, there are these issues. I think education is primary. I mean, you have to have to educate your girl child. I mean, that is so essential. And you have to educate the mother. You know, that, that those issues go without a saying. And probably then they can be changed. And I think the South has done much better as far as literacy rates are concerned. Yeah. But I think perhaps Lotus, I should have the last yeah. one. <laughs> I, I wanted to add an explanation yeah. about this question. I think the principal difference between South and North is that the caste system is much weaker in the South because there has been an anti bribery movement for about a hundred years. And also, the Christian influence was much bigger through schools uh, in the South than it was in the North. So now it still continues to be much more traditional Hindu caste system oriented. South has a caste system, but it is a much weaker, uh, bigger hierarchical relationship uh, than, than the North. So, and uh, what, what the, the Dravid movement, uh, the Justice Party and, uh, and DMK and so on, actually gave high status to the lower castes and, and the untouchables. And that, had, that may have made a lot of to the difference in the attitude. I mean, this is, we, we are dealing with very complex, multivariate problems, so you know, it's not going to be an easy explanation. I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I might start to bring the evening to a close. I think we've had a very good discussion about the central themes of three great novels. We haven't even discussed the fourth book, which, uh, Darling Ji, uh, which is a very touching uh, account, uh, I think, in any case, of a cinematic. Um, but it raises the question, what's the next big project? Are you going to maintain this very important, very, very difficult theme for yet another novel, or are you going to try something different for the next book? Well, you know, I'm, I'm at that very difficult stage where I have three wonderful books to write, and I'm really not being able to decide either which one to do. So I wish I had a three-faced coin or something that I could, you know, toss and then make up my mind. But I think uh, the final call will probably be taken by my agent, alas. You know, she will probably tell me, this is the book you have to write next, but make my life easier. But there are three really, really nice books. One of them has to do with the continuation of the series which I don't want to give up on because I do feel we need to keep going back to gender, we need to keep looking, re revisiting it, you know, and looking at whether we've really made a difference. Okay, well, whichever book, and for all the books in the future, I think you take uh, our best wishes and our fondest hopes for their great success. 
great hopes also for the film that the British producer is going to try to make of the sea of innocence. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've all been very privileged tonight to have been here for a very frank and an extremely, I think, important discussion which hasn't shirked the important and the dynamic issues of today's India. And I think that we should show our gratitude to Kishma Desai in the traditional manner.